Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to continue reading Journey to the River Sea by Eva Abotson. The illustrations in this book are done by Kevin Hankies, and uh, this book is published by Puffin Books. We're going to pick up where we left off on chapter three, where Maya and the governess Miss Minton have just arrived at the um, city they're going to live in in Brazil along the Amazon River. Chapter three. Maya had been certain that the twins would be at the docks to meet them, but there was no sign of them or their parents. The passengers had all left the ship, their luggage had gone through customs, the bustle of the quayside had died away, and still no one came up to, no one came up to them. Do you think they've forgotten us, said Maya, trying to sound offhand. Suddenly she felt very forlorn and incredibly far away from everyone she knew. Don't be silly, snapped Miss Minton, but her nose looked even sharper than usual as she turned her head from side to side, searching the quayside. They had waited over an hour when a man in a crumpled cream suit and a Panama hat came up to them. I'm Raphael Lima, the agent of Mr. Carter, he said. He had a sad yellow face and a drooping mustache, and his hand, as he shook theirs, was moist and limp. Mr. Carter had sent the boat for you. He could not come himself. They followed him and the porter to a floating dock on which were moored boats of every kind. Dug out canoes, fleet sailing boats with names like Firefly and Swallow, and trim launches with gaily striped awnings and gleaming paint. But the Carter's boat was painted a serious dark green, like spinach. The awning was dark green, too, and there was no name painted on the side, only the word Carter to show who owned it. As they came up to the boat, a native who had been perched on one of the bales of rubber waiting to be loaded got up and threw away his cigarette. This is Furo, the Carter's boatman. It is he who will take you there. And with another limp handshake, Lima was gone. Furo was not like the natives that they had passed, smiling and waving, not like the sailors on the boat with whom Maya had joked. He showed them into the cabin and shrugged when they said they wanted to sit on the deck. Then he started the engine, lit another cigarette, and stared unsmiling out at the dark river. They traveled for an hour up the Negro, leaving all signs of the town behind them. Without realizing it, Maya had edged closer to Miss Mitten. It was oddly different, the stretch of the river, straight and silent, with no sandbanks or islands and no animals to be seen. And the people working on the rubber trees along the shore who looked up as the boat passed and then turned away. Then Furo pointed to the right-hand bank and they saw a low wooden house painted the same dark green as the boat with a veranda running its length. And down the jetty waiting to greet them were four people, a woman holding a parasol, a man in a sun hat, and two girls. The twins, cried Maya, her face alight. Oh look, there they are. Her spirits rose with a bound. They were there and everything was going to be all right. Miss Minton gathered up their belongings the boat came in quietly, and without waiting for Furo to help her, Maya jumped out onto the jetty. Remembering her manner, she went first to Mrs. Carter and curtsied. The twins' mother was plump with a heavily powdered face, a double chin, and carefully waved hair. She looked like the sort of person who would smell of violets or lavender, but to Maya's surprise, she smelled very strongly of Lysol. It was a smell Maya knew well because it was what the maids had used at school to disinfect the lavatories. I trust you have had a good journey, Miss Carter said, and looked taken aback when Maya said it had been lovely. Then she called Clifford, and her husband, who had been giving orders about the boat, turned around to do his duty. Mr. Carter was a thin, gloomy-looking man with gold-rimmed spectacles. He was wearing long khaki shorts and mosquito boots, and did not seem very interested in the arrival of either Maya or her governess. And now, as Miss Mitten, in her turn, shook hands with the Carters, Maya was free to turn to the twins. She had imagined them well. They were fair, they were pretty, and they were dressed in white. They wore straw hats, each with a different colored ribbon around the rim, one pink and one blue, and the sash sashes around their flounced dresses matched their hats. Their fair ringlets, a little limp in the heat, touched their collars. Their round cheeks were flushed. Their light blue eyes were framed by pale, almost colorless lashes. And here's a picture of Mrs. Carter and the twins. I'm Beatrice, said the one with the pink ribbon and the pink sash. She gave Maya her hand. Even so short a distance from her house, she was wearing gloves. Maya turned from one to the other. 
Though they were so alike down to the droop of their shoulders, she thought that she would always be able to tell them apart. Beatrice was just a little plumper and taller. Her eyes had a little more color. Her scanty ringlets had more body than Gwendolyn's, and she had a tiny mole in her neck. It was as though Beatrice was the mold from which Gwendolyn had been taken, and she guessed that Beatrice was older, if only by a few minutes. But now Gwendolyn held out her hand. She had taken off her glove, and her hand stayed in Maya's a little longer than Beatrice's had done. Then they turned to follow their parents into the house. But Maya lingered for a moment, looking down at the palm of her outstretched hand. Then she shook her head, ashamed of her thoughts, and ran off after the others. An hour later, Maya and Mrs. Minton sat in upright chairs on the veranda, having afternoon tea with the family. The veranda was a narrow wooden structure which faced the river, but was completely sealed off from it by wire netting and glass. No breath of wind came out from outside, no scent of growing things. Two flypapers hung down on either side, on which dying insects buzzed frantically, trying to free their wings. On low tables were set bowls of mentholated spirit, in which a number of mosquitoes had drowned, or were still drowning. The wooden walls were painted the same dark clinical green as the house and the boat. It was like being in the corridor of a hospital. Maya would not have been surprised to see people lying about on stretchers waiting for their operations. Mrs. Carter sat, on a wicker table, sat at a wicker table, pouring tea and adding powdered milk. There was a plate of small dry biscuits with little holes in them and nothing else. We have them sent specially from England, said Mrs. Carter, looking at the biscuits, and Maya could not help wondering why they had taken so much trouble. She never tasted anything so dull. You'll never find native food served at my table, Miss Carter went on. There are people here who go to the markets and buy the food that they eat, but I would never permit it. Nothing is clean. Everything is full of germs. The word germs made her mouth pinch up into a disapproving O. Couldn't it be washed? asked Maya, remembering the lovely fruit and vegetables that she had seen at the markets, but Mrs. Carter said that washing was not enough. We disinfect everything, just in case, but it doesn't help. They are filthy, and if one is to survive out here, the jungle must be kept at bay. The jungle certainly had been kept at bay. There were no plants on the window sills, none of the lovely orchids and crimson flame flowers that had been on the balconies of the houses that they had passed along the shore, and the garden was a square of raked gravel. In England, I always had cut flowers in the house, Miss Carter went on. Lady Parsons used to say that no one could arrange roses better than me. Didn't she, girls? The twins nodded in exactly the same way. Once down, once up. Yes, Mama, they said. But not here, she sighed. Lady Parsons is a relation, she explained, a second co cousin on my mother's side. Do you have any pets? Maya shyly asked Gwendolyn, who was sitting next to her. There seemed to be no kittens, no dogs, no canary, singing in a cage anywhere in the dark house. In the corner, propped against a chair, was a large flit gun, a canister full of, of fly spray. Gwendolyn turned to Beatrice. Maya had already noticed that it was usually Beatrice who spoke first. No, we certainly don't have any pets, she said. Pets bring in fleas and lice, said Gwendolyn, soothing, smoothing down her spotless white dress and horrible worms that crawl into your insides, said Beatrice, looking meaningfully, meaningfully at Maya. All right, girls, that will do, said Miss Carter. A maid came to bring more hot water. She had two gold teeth and the same sulky close looks, look as fear of the boatman, and when Maya smiled at her, she did not smile back. Did you bring us any presents, Beatrice asked, and Maya said yes, and asked if she could get them from her case. Oh, but those are made here. They're market things, said the girls when she came back. We want proper presents from England. Maya tried not to feel snubbed. Then she caught Miss Mitten's eye and said, I wanted to bring some baby chicks, and the twins shuddered. Now, Miss Minton, if you will come with me, I will inform you of your duties, said Mrs. Carter. Beatrice and Gwendolyn, will you show Maya where she is to sleep? The Carters had built their bungalow on land that had belonged to the natives. The main rooms faced the river. The dining room was a large oak table and back, button back chairs. The drawing room furnished with overstuffed sofas, a marble clock, and a large painting of Lady Parsons wearing a choker of pearls, and Mr. Carter's study. All the windows were covered in layers of mosquito netting, and the shutters were kept partially closed so that the rooms were not only hot but dark. From the front of the house, two extensions ran back towards the forest. 
Maya's room was at the end of one of these, a small bare room with a narrow bed, a chest of drawers, and a wooden table. There were no pictures, no flowers, and the smell of Lysol was overpowering. Mama made it scrub them scrub it out three times, said Beatrice. It used to be a storeroom. There was only one window, very high, but there were two doors. One led out into the corridor and one which was bolted. Where does that door leave? lead, Maya asked. Out to the compound where the servants live. You must keep it locked always. We never go out there. So how do you go outside, Maya asked. To the river, I mean, in the forest. The twins looked at each other. We don't go anywhere out there because it's too hot and full of horrible animals. When we go anywhere, we go under the boat to, to Manus for our dancing lesson and our piano lesson. And you mustn't go out either. If you did, we'd have to tell Mama and you'd get in trouble. Maya tried to take this in. It looked as though the Carters were pretending they were still in England. The maid will help you unpack, said Beatrice. She's stupid, but it's her job. What's her name? asked Maya. Toffee. Is she the one who brought hot water for the tea? Yes. Remembering the sullen, heavy face of the woman, Maya said that she could manage on her own. All right. Supper's at seven. There's a gong. As they opened the door, Maya heard Mrs. Carter's ra voice raised loudly in the quarter. Just to remember this, Miss Minton, I shall always know. Always. The, miss, the twins looked at each other and giggled. She's warning her not to remove her corset, they whispered. Some of the other governess tried to do it, but Mama can always tell. Oh, but surely in this heat, began Maya, and, a, and bit off her words. She could imagine how uncomfortable those stiff, wired garments would be in this climate. Supper in the dining room, under the whir of a creaking fan, was not a cheerful meal. They ate tinned beetroot and tinned corned beef, both shipped out from England, followed by a green jelly which had not set and had to be chased over the plate with a spoon. When the Carters first came for, from England, their servants had cooked all the best dishes that were eating in Brazil. Freshly caught fish served in saffron sauce, sweet peppers stuffed with raisins and rice, roasted sweet corn and chunky soups. They had picked fresh fruit for the Carters, mangoes and guavas and pomegranates, and had gone out at night to search for turtle eggs. But not for long. Only British food will be served at my table, Mrs. Carter had said. So the servants had given up. They opened the tins for whatever came from England. They poured boiling water into whatever pudding powder Miss Carter had put out for them, not caring if it was rock hard or running off the plate, and went back to their huts to make themselves decent food at night. Shall I call Miss Minton, Maya had asked as they sat down. Perhaps she didn't hear the gong. Miss Minton will have supper in her room, said Mrs. Carter. Governesses join us at breakfast and lunch, but never at dinner. Mrs. Porterhouse never had dinner with us, said Beatrice. Nor did Mrs. Chisholm. Maya was silent. She had a governess before she went to the academy. She'd been part of the family, sharing all meals except for formal dinner parties when she and Maya ate together in the schoolroom. And to her dismay, Maya felt a lump come into her throat when she remembered the warmth and laughter of her old home. After supper, the girls worked on their embroidery, and Mrs. Car Mr. Carter went to his study. He had said almost nothing during the meal, only complaining once because the servants had moved some papers on his desk. I can't trust anyone out here, he grumbled and told Maya to beware because all the natives were out to cheat you. I expect you must be tired after your journey, said Mrs. Carter. And Maya said yes, she was, and went back to her room. Presently, there was a knock at the door, and Miss Minton came in. She looked at Maya's room in silence. I'm next door, she said. And then, do you need any help with your hair? Maya shook her head, but Miss Minton took the silver-backed brush and started to brush the long, thick hair. She said nothing for a while, letting Maya gather herself together. It's not quite like I thought it would be, is it? said Maya ruefully. I don't think the twins like me. They will do when they get to know you. Remember, the twins are used to living in their own world. She put down the brush and began to rebraid Maya's hair. Give them time. Yes, it's just... I don't really understand why the Carters offered to have me. Miss Minton opened her mouth and closed it again. She knew exactly why they had offered to have Maya. Her interview with Mrs. Carter had made that absolutely clear, but she would not tell Maya. The child had been hurt enough by her parents' death. You'll see. It will all look different in the morning. Have courage. Courage is the most important thing. Yes. Left alone, Maya climbed into bed. There was no fan. It was incredibly hot and stuffy, but she would have courage. She stretched out her hand and looked at the tiny bruise in the skin. 
It was silly to think that Gwendolyn had dug her fingernail into her palm. Why should she want to hurt someone that she had never met? She must have had something caught in her glove and not realized it. A little piece of wire or a thorn. But not a thorn from a rose in this house without flowers. And had she been wearing her glove? Maya turned out the lamp, but still could not sleep. After a while, she got up and pulled a chair up to the window. Out there in the forest were the huts of the native people who worked for the carters. Not cool native huts with thatched roofs, but wooden shacks built to house servants. She lifted a corner of the mosquito ne netting and saw fireflies, a hundred points of dancing light, and heard the creaking of croaking of frogs. How alive it was out there, and how dead it was inside the house. She watched as she saw a girl in a bright frock, carrying a baby on her hip, go into the middle hut. As she opened the door, there was a jabber of a tame parrot, the brief yapping of a little dog, and then there came a sound of singing, a slow crooning song, a lullaby for the baby, perhaps. Then, silence again. But just before she left the window, she heard someone whistling. The sound came from behind the end hut, set a little way back in the forest. The strange thing was that she knew the tune. It was a North Country air, blow the wind southerly. Her mother had sung it often. She listened until it died away and then went back to bed. Hearing the familiar tune so far away from home had comforted her, and almost at once she slept. Mr. and Mrs. Carter had come to the Amazon from Littleford-on-Sea, a small town in the south of England. Mr. Carter had worked in a bank, but he had lost his job and decided to take his family to the Amazon to make his fortune. Many Europeans went out at the beginning of the century, some to plant coffee or cocoa, some to try to find gold, but most to harvest rubber, the black gold of the Amazon. It sounded like an easy way to get rich. Rubber trees grew all over the Amazon basin. All one had to do was hire some native people to collect the sap from the trees, take it to the sheds to be smoked, and send the balls of crude rubber down the river to be exported. And certainly a lot of people had made their fortune. There were people in McManus who lived like princes, but not the Carters, because to get the juice from the rubber trees, you need native people who know the forest and understand the trees. And native, the native people were proud who had their own lives. If you treated them like slaves, if you treat them like slaves, they don't revolt or go on strike. They simply melt back into the forest, join their tribes and disappear. This is what had happened to the native people whom the Carters had employed. Every month, Mr. Carter lost some of his workforce and far from making his fortune, he was getting poorer and poorer. So when Mr. Murray had written to ask him if they would have Maya to live with him, the Carters had been overjoyed. They did not want Maya. They were far too selfish to want anybody, but they needed her. Or rather, they needed the money that she brought with her. Mr. Murray had never told Maya how much money her father had left her. She knew she did not have to worry about having enough, and she seldom thought about it. But the fact was that she was rich now, and it would be richer when she was 21. The Carters had explained that life was very expensive on the, the, the Amazon, Everything had to be shipped from England, every digestive biscuit, every jar of marmalade. So they had asked for a very large sum of money for having Maya live with them. And they had also insisted that a large part of Miss Mitten's salary be paid by Mr. Murray. They'd love to have Maya for nothing, Mr. Car Mrs. Carter had written, but times are hard. Mr. Murray had agreed, but he was a careful man, as lawyers are. He had sent the first month's keep with Miss Mitten, for he knew she could be trusted. Later, Maya's allowance and the money for Miss Mitten would go straight into a bank. And Miss Mitten would only need a few minutes to realize why the Carters had wanted Maya. Mrs. Carter had not been able to hide her relief and her greed as Miss Mitten counted out the notes that the lawyer had trusted her with. As for Beatrice and Gwendolyn, they had been told nothing, only that a distant cousin was coming to stay with them and they must, she must be welcomed. But the twins had never welcomed any, anybody in their lives. Maya woke the next morning, not to the sound of birdsong, but to a noise that she could not place at first. A sort of squishing, squelching noise, followed by thumps and bumps and cries of out. She put her head around the door. In the corridor, wearing a dressing gown and a turban to protect her hair, was Mrs. Carter. She had the flick gun in her hand and was carefully squirting every nook and cranny with insect killer. Then she disappeared into the cloakroom, fetched a broom, and began to thump and bang on the ceiling to get rid of possible spiders. Next came a bucket full of disinfectant and a mop, which she squelched across the tile floor. All the time she muttered, Ouch, or that will settle you, to the insects that she thought might be there. 
Mrs. Carter did nothing else in the house, but this early morning hunt was not one that she did not trust to the servants. Then, after breakfast, Maya started lessons with the twins. They did them in the dining room, sitting in the big oak table. The room was already hot at eight in the morning. They could not use the fan because it blew the pages of the books about, and to the smell of insect killer were added the other morning scents of the house, carbolic soap, Lysol, and Jay's disinfecting fluid. Mrs. Carter had been given, had given clear orders to Miss Minton. The girls work from a set of books by Dr. Bowman. As you see, the books cover all the subjects that they will need. She pointed to Dr. Bowman's English grammar, Dr. Bowman's English composition, Dr. Bowman's French primer, Dr. Bowman's history of England, and Dr. Bowman's geography. All the books have the same brown covers, and on each one was a picture of Dr. Bowman himself. He had a pointed beard, staring eyes, and a bulging forehead. And as Maya looked at him, she felt a slight lurching of the stomach. I want you to stick absolutely to the exercises in the book, Mrs. Carter went on. No making things up, no straying. I've always made this the rule. Then when a governess leaves, the next one knows exactly where to take over. Yes, Miss Carter. Every three months, a progress report is set out to Mr. B to Dr. Bowman in England. You'll, of course, show me yours before you send it. She gave a couple of squirts of the flick gun in the direction of the windows where a small fly had appeared. You'll find the books clear and easy to use, she said, and left. The twins were dressed in white again. Today, Beatrice had a green ribbon in her hair, and Gwendolyn's was yellow. Seeing them so fresh and pretty made Maya ashamed of her thoughts the night before, and she smiled at them. They would be friends in the end, she was sure of it. Miss Mitten looked at the timetable. English grammar was first. She opened Dr. Bowman at the page with the marker. That's where we were when Mrs. Porter left. Porterhouse left, said Beatrice, with a sly look at her governess. She left suddenly, said Dr. Gwendolyn. Mama sent her away. Miss Minton gave her a steely gaze. Beatrice, read out the paragraph on the use of the comma, please. The comma is used to divide a se sentence into f phrases, read Beatrice. She read slowly and with difficulty, and Maya looked up surprised, for Beatrice was older than her, and they had done the use of the comma two years earlier at the academy. Now, Gwendolyn, look at the first exercise. Where does the comma go in that sentence? Gwendolyn's round blue eyes looked puzzled. After... After station? No. Have another look. The morning dragged on. Dr. Bullman's exercises were the most boring that Maya had ever seen, and the girls worked so slowly that she had to look away to hide her expression. But when Miss Minton asked Maya to read a paragraph, she stopped her almost at once. All right, Maya, that will do, she said crossly, and Maya looked up puzzled. It was a ridiculously easy passage. Surely she had not read it wrong, but Miss Minton did not ask her to read again. After English grammar came English composition. Dr. Bowman did not believe that children should write stories using their imaginations. He gave set subjects, examples of how to begin, how to end, and the number of words that they were to use. Then came French and Maya had to sit in silence while the twins stumbled over phrases that she had learned in her first year. But boredom was not as bad as knowing that she had upset Miss Minton. The governess gave her no chance to read or take part. She did not even look at her. Maya had begun to think of Miss Minton as her friend, but clearly she was wrong. At 11, Miss Carter came back with a flit gun, followed by the sullen maid, with a jug of tinned orange juice and four of the dry biscuits that they had the day before. Would you like to take your elevens in the garden? Suggested Miss Minton. The twins looked at her in amazement. We never go out in the garden, said Beatrice, looking at the raked square of gravel, which a native person was spraying with something. You get stung, offered Gwendolyn. So they stayed in the hot room with a loudly ticking clock. After break came arithmetic. The twins were better at that, and as it was Maya's weakest subject, she was able to work at the sums without too much boredom. But... History, which for Dr. Bowman was the history of England and nowhere else, was deadly. The repeal of the Corn Laws and a list of pointless dates. There was not one lesson which touched the lives of the twins in Brazil. Geography was about coach buildings in Birmingham. And religious instruction was about a girl who would not read her Bible and was struck down by a terrible disease. After lunch, the twins did needlework in the drawing room, watched by their mother, who kept the flit gun on her chair, as other women might keep a pet dog. A Dachshund or a Pekingese. Uh, Another hour of lessons followed. Then Miss Minton suggested they might 
read some poetry, and Maya's face lit up. Must we, asked Beatrice. Can't we just go on with the exercises? Very well, said Miss Mitten, ignoring Maya's disappointed face. The afternoon ended with the, pi the twins' piano practice. They did exactly a half hour each with a metronome set. The scales, arpeggios, the dance of the butterfly, the merry peasant, and after half an hour exactly they stopped, even if they were in the middle of a bar. And you, Maya? asked Car Mrs. Carter. Did you have piano lessons in England? Yes, I did. Well, then you better practice, too, said Mrs. Carter. Of course, Beatrice and Gwendolyn have, are exceptionally musical, so you mustn't be jealous. So Maya went to the piano. With anything else, she might have pretended to have less skill, but music was too important. She, too, practiced her scales in her arpeggio. Then she began to play the Beethoven sonata she'd been studying at the academy. Mrs. Carter allowed the first movement to soar out over the room, but when Maya began on the heartbreakingly lovely adagio, she put down her sewing. All right, that will do, she said pettishly. I have a headache coming. As she sat at supper, to which Miss Mitten was not allowed to come, it occurred to Maya that the twins had not once been out of doors, not for five minutes, to look at the river or to take a stroll. How am I going to stand it, thought Maya, shut up like a prisoner. Back in her room, she turned out the lamp and pushed the chair under the window, as she had done the night before. She was beginning to make out the people who lived there. In the middle hut lived Fira the boatman and Tappy, the sullen maid whom, to whom he was married. But it was from there that the singing had coming, had been coming, so there had to be other people living there. So sulky a woman could not have sung such a lullaby. The girl with the baby lived in the hut on the left. She was the wife of the gardener who sprayed Mrs. Carter's gravel and was half Portuguese, which is why her baby sometimes wore nappies instead of running naked, as the native people's babies did. The little dog belonged to her. There was a chicken run behind the huts, an old woman with long gray hair came out sometime to feed them, and Maya had heard the grunting of a pig, but all the animal noises were quickly hushed for fear of the carters, she guessed. The next three days were exactly the same. The sounds of squirting and stamping at dawn, Dr. Bowman's boring lessons, unspeakable meals, tinned fish in a bluish sauce, endless beetroot, a cornstarch shape that seemed to quiver with fear as Tappy brought it to the table, the twins always looked so clean and fresh in the morning, but were flushed and grumpy by the end of the day. Mr. Carter scarcely spoke and disappeared into his study, and whenever it was Maya's turn at the piano, Mrs. Carter had a headache. But Maya could have coped with it all. What really upset her was Miss Mitten. Her governess went on ignoring her lessons and never let her read or answer questions, while well, Beatrice and Gwendolyn became more and more smug as they saw Maya being showed up as a fool. My, must, I must have made her angry, thought Maya, but try as she would, she could not think what she had done. Then on the fourth night, there was a knock at the door, and Miss Minton entered. Right, she said, come down off that chair. I think we're ready for the next step. What do you mean? I'm going to see Mrs. Carter tomorrow. I shall tell her that you are not able to keep up with the twins and lessons. But Miss Minton held up her hand. Don't interrupt, please. I shall tell her that I will set you back to work separately, because you are holding the twins back. It means I am trusting you to work on your own. She'll, of course, help you whenever I can, but you must keep up the deception. She gave one of her tight smiles. I don't see why we shouldn't have an interesting time. I have a book about the history of Brazil and one by Bates, the explorer who first described this part of the Amazon, and another by Humboldt, a great scientist. The twins may live as though they are still in Littleford on sea, but there is no need for us to do so. Maya jumped up from the chair. Oh, Minty, she said, and threw her arms around her governess. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I thought, well, don't, said Miss Mitten briskly, and then come along. It's time we opened my trunk. Miss Minton had been poor all her life. She had no trinkets, no personal possessions. Her employers underpaid her when they paid her at all, but her trunk was in Aladdin's cave. There were travel books and fairy tales, novels and dictionaries and collections of poetries. How did you get them all? Maya asked wonderingly. How did you manage? Miss Mitten shrugged. If you want something, usually you get it, but you have to take what goes with it. And she pointed to her shabby blouse and mended skirt. Now let's see, what shall we start with? Ah oh, yes, here's Bates. He must have sailed down this very river not 60 years ago. Look at this drawing of a sloth. That's where we're going to end for today. We'll pick up tomorrow with chapter four.
This has been Journey to the River Sea by Eva Abotson. The pictures in this book are by Kevin Hankies, and this book is published by Penguin Books. I hope you'll join me tomorrow for some more. My name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye.